embrace life with a change for the better. Challenge your comfort zone with Glenn Miller, your personal comfort zone coach, enabling you in whatever way you may need to, to step outside your comfort zone. The Outside Your Comfort Zone podcast explores proactive and practical tips based on years of lessons learned and expert skills and advice that will enable you to accomplish more. Each episode puts a spotlight on topics and experts in their field who will compel you to action and to get more things done outside your comfort zone. Whether you're starting from zero or already an avid exercise freak, today I introduce my first guest with a whole lot of pride who I think will knock your socks off with some urban legends I hope we can bust and some myths we can tackle using practical, simple guides for anyone to avoid injury. Get fit on your own terms, stay healthy, avoid risk, and overall, get healthier and feel better about yourself, but always realizing it may not be fun all of the time, and you should sometimes challenge your comfort zone in doing so. So to the man of the moment, I have with me Ian Colico. Ian. Tell us a bit about you. Tell us a bit about yourself. Oh, first of all, Glenn, thanks for letting me uh, chat with you today. I feel privileged to be asked. Uh, and hopefully we'll be able to share some knowledge today that can help others um, as well as enjoy ourselves doing it. So I've been um, a sports physio for uh, 30 years now. Um, it's my 30th year in practice. Um, I practice in Bondi Junction and uh, I have uh, a keen interest in letting people reach their their desired goal. Um, I have a background in training in uh, through Sydney University and then uh, I did some postgraduate studies in hand and upper limb just to add a different spoke to our wheel and I've covered uh, sports internationally and domestically ranging from water sports to um, court and field sports, track and field, and uh, rugby and uh, volleyball as well at an international level. Thanks, Ian. That's amazing. And I, and I think what I love is the, the cross-section. You know, clearly there's specialized areas of what you do. Um, but for me, I think it's a good lead into the importance of what I'd like to share with our listeners about how I came to seeing you. And since everyone out there has their kind of guru they're physio genius, you know, just like I have you, quite frankly, that's that's kind of the bucket I place you in. Our session is not a, a physio bashing, bashing session today by any means. And just to be clear, it's it's about imparting an angle um, to provide our listeners with knowledge and hopefully empower them and equip them with the information to make their own decisions. And if they can't afford a physio, for example, then I hope they can actually walk away with some practical tips and tools and techniques to implement and apply in their daily lives get healthier, fitter, active uh, on the back of what I'm hoping, you know, you and we can share with them today. So I think, Ian, just kind of leading into my next question, uh, important to share is probably my story to finding you um, and just to be, mm -hmm. you know, jump straight to it. I think, you know, there were two separate unrelated surgeon referrals, to be blunt, that led me to you. The one was my shoulder dislocation and I had a, um, um, a reconstruction uh, years ago, quite frankly. And what stuck with me about, firstly, the referral to you is one most people would get. But when I worked into your practice to just uh, isolate the symptoms and the cause, I remember you putting these pads on my shoulder and it was quite archaic. It was just flat pads. They stuck on different parts of my shoulder and you put them on my good shoulder, you put them on the bad shoulder and we closed my eyes and I moved my arm and the lines were all wonky. And what I loved about your approach at that time was it, it just scientifically showed how certain ligaments were off whack. And then you explained to me how we're going to have to switch that around, which is caused to my dislocation. And it was actually, it was just a broken down, A, there was signs, I saw it before my eyes. And then B, I had to do all the work based on very specific exercises you gave me around what that problem was. So, so that was the one scenario. And you fixed that for me. And dare I say, well, I don't know if it's 12 years since I've been seeing you or 10 years, um, I haven't needed a surgery. So the proof's in the pudding. The second one was the knee ACL surgery. So I tore my ACL, a cruciate ligament. And then same thing, um, a, the, the surgeon referred me to you and, and the practice to put me onto a program where again, I did all the work, which led to fixing it. So 
When I think of you, Ian, the words preventative maintenance and proactive come to mind. And I know it's probably my mindset, which may differ from the listeners generally, but maybe you can elaborate if this too is what you believe, or do you think it's something different, that preventative maintenance and proactive mindset? So, Glenn, uh, it's a it's a long history, maybe <laughs> uh, twelve years has it been such a, such a long time. I think um, so. <laughs> f- so, first of all, uh, I would qualify one of the things that you mentioned about the pads on your shoulder to let your um, your audience realise that those were not like a treatment. A passive treatment tool, but they were actually an assessment tool. Um, that was EMG measuring your uh, muscle activity 12 years ago. And uh, we had it um, cast up on a, a screen so you could see the activity yourself, which would help you to adjust your performance through your knowledge of your performance. So rather than just thinking about prevention, um, I, I would say that what we're looking at is enhancing performance at the same time with the same uh, modalities, the same methods that we prevent injury because the outcomes, the two different outcomes of injury prevention and performance enhancement seem to occur through the one intervention. And that intervention is multifactorial. The first thing is that it involves, as you discovered with the uh, assessment of your shoulder, that you need to be part of the solution by understanding. And so we use understanding, or other people call it education or information, but I like it to be deeper than that in understanding. What your problem is, uh, is one of the key elements in helping you to commit to uh, a solution. And the second thing is that you actually have to be active. Um, our practice is called active care for that reason. <laughs> so you you uh, you didn't sit there and something recklessly happened through the machinery or through my hands, my fingertips. It was through sharing knowledge, obtaining an understanding, and then executing a well thought out plan that we shared ownership of. That is, you were part of the solution and I was part of the solution. And together, we um, we shared the decisions and um, uh, that gave us a, a stronger motive to, to get the result we want. I love it. So it's, you know, on the one level you're saying, yes, it's pr- that word prevent is in there and is, uh, risk and injury management. Mm. The other one is kind of the mindset, the understanding that – uh, the person, some of our sessions are quite psychologically based. We just, we sit there talking because I think mm. it forces you to take a moment and actually think about the causality, like you said. And then behind mm. that understanding is the act of the action plan. And I think a lot of people mm. sometimes put too much, uh, it's unfair, but they put this uh, weight on the, their physio. I'm going to go in and w- magic wand is waved and I walk out pain free. Or mm. I often have mm. heard it, I went to three physios, it didn't work because they may, maybe just didn't do the active part. So, so I think again, Ian, mm. it's, um, it's a good transition. Um, you know, when I just look at your bio and your website and kind of a transition into the next, the next question, it, it says that you have a, a passion for helping people achieve their optimal function. So can you explain what someone's optimal function means? Cause I think it's a good tie in to these, these previous three points we've just made. You know, does it differ from mm. or to an ordinary exercise? Yeah, it's it's um it's a good question because I think the answer is really nicely open. Uh, the the whole idea behind uh, modern medicine and patient care is that we have what we call a patient centered model, okay, and that involves um, patient centered decision making, um, helping patients to make informed decisions. Uh, but having the person who has the problem at the centre of that uh, uh, learning process and therefore a recovery process. It's very different from the traditional biomedical model, which is almost like an authoritative model wherein um, your treating practitioner, surgeon, physiotherapist, whoever, dictates to you a solution to a problem based upon their analysis 
and executes that um, intervention uh, with you passively receiving it. So the patient-centred care model is one that uh, is really far more effective um, and much more respectful of the person by inviting them right into the centre of the process. And what that means when we start to look at optimising their performance then or optimising their, their scenario, it will be that we need to understand the person and what their goals are. And so for some of my patients, that could be to run their best time in a marathon. For others, it could be to compete at a really high international level of sport. For others, it could be to be able to play with their grandchild on the floor mm -hmm. or to be able to walk from their their uh, bed to their um, to their lounge. But it's what excites them and gives them quality of life. So when you say, I had a great day today, it's going to be different how you define quality of life in your day compared to how I define mine or the next person. And you might say, well, you know what? I went for a coffee with my mum and it was just wonderful and I'll never forget that. <laughs> uh, and for others, it might be, gosh, I have a coffee every day with my mum and I'm bored by that or, you know, and they don't have the same attachment as you may have had with your uh, relatives, okay? And so what we're finding is that we get a definition of what's important to us and that gives us what is optimal, okay? Because it's, it's, it's an optimal day for me when I've enjoyed time with my family. But I think it you might also be an optimal day for the next person for yeah. some, for achieving their highest physical pursuit or whatever. But it also sounds like it means it's quite an adaptive approach that um, you know if it is something more longer term or um, it's almost like a it's a patient centric approach. So basically, I'm heading to, mm. to suggest that you have a whole lot of tools in your toolbox and maybe there is a cookie cutter mm. there in terms of a physio's perspective, but it sounds like you're actually, you, you're going a bit different in that you're catering to the individual person's needs in what you're saying and their lifestyle mm. to help them function optimally, not just if they're a super duper athlete, but if they're just a common, like you said, a grandparent, you know, housewife who've been restricted by some physicality that's causing them not just function on a normal level. Yeah. So that's right. And it's further further to that though, Glenn, is that you have this situation where you've got two experts in the conversation. Someone who's an expert in the field of the condition, the, uh, the biology and the psychology and the, the anatomy and so on of the condition, the physiology and, and the like. But there's someone who's an expert about themselves, and that's the person who has the injury. Mm -hmm. And so they oftentimes have the answers in a far more clear way. And if we let them into the conversation, then they will actually be able to produce realistic solutions with our um, guidance and intervention. Gotcha. Okay. okay. So no, no, it's, it's awesome. And Does that seem to make sense? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, yeah. you know, so, so, so again, to like build on that then, like li literally, aside from the surgeons referring me to you literally, like to me, that's the highest standard, you know, not, not to kind of um, um, f flavor you up and lift you up on a pedestal, but I think, I think it, it, it should because in the medical practice, you know, if at least I reckon it's like a dentist, who's the dentist they see? You know, I mean, it's, it's a pretty massive endorsement as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, so, that, so for, for me, it was the shoulder, it was the knee, but the fact that they both led me to you was, was a hell of an endorsement. And so what led me to your approach, which also describes your approach again on your website, like the latest scientific research. And that's why I folded in just explaining um, to give our listeners a picture of that scientific approach with pads and um, as you explained and then extrapolated the specific purpose for that, I'm not suggesting you do that with every single consult, um, but they were two totally unrelated anatomic um, disciplines, you know, shoulder, knee, and it's not a fluke that I was referred to you twice. So again, just coming back kind of to this reference to a scientific research, I suppose, and I, was, I don't want to say approach because it doesn't say that, but just scientific research. 
Can you explain why that's important? And for people already going to physios, like how can they translate this back into their world to almost push their physio to, to challenge the best type of care or maintenance or programs or approach? And again, I, I suppose just focusing on that scientific research part, like what does that mean to you and how do you fold it in? How could they then think about that if they're not already receiving that kind of care? We live in an increasingly data-driven world and an increasingly uh, scientific world. However, there's a, also, and we've seen this on the social scene in uh, the last two, three years in particular, um, where we're also becoming quite polarised with our viewpoints. And we, we're a very emotional race. And so we we tend to we tend to um, gravitate to the things that we like to hear. And so we can build uh, mythology very easily around that. And that also extends to to health. So we can maintain traditions and um, and uh, myths based upon uh, what seems to match our thought process rather than what... Uh, ideal scientific evidence would suggest. Okay, so if we are prepared to be evidence-based as best we can, and there's a paucity of evidence in most every part of medicine, really, um, if we w- want to be evidence-based, then what we want to try to do is uh, look at the research as best we can, try to integrate it into our um, decision-making process and our interventions and also into our understanding um, and sharing of information. So if I do a massage for a shoulder pain because that's what everybody does and that's what's expected and that's what we always do, well, then that's not really necessarily looking at what is what the science is saying. The science could be saying that people who massage their shoulder over 12 weeks compared to people who exercise over 12 weeks have a different outcome. Mm. And so we would be remiss to avoid that information that's available. And we can't have our head around every chunk of information. And so we try our best to keep up with the knowledge base and that helps us to make good decisions and good interventions. So the grandfather of uh, evidence-based medicine defines evidence-based treatment as such. So the grandfather of evidence-based medicine is Sackett, and he defined it as three things. Number one, the current literature and science base. Okay, so that would be like the journals and the research papers and so on. Number two, the current best practice that your peers are practicing in the absence of of any information, okay, um, and also through uh, anecdotal and, and personal experience. So good practitioners tend to have a knowledge base themselves regardless of the science. And then the third thing is, believe it or not, the patient's belief systems and their expectations. Mm-hmm. So a treatment that I could give to someone who is of our society in Australia, Sydney, in 2021 would be very different to the treatment that I would be effective with for someone living in a village in Fiji um, in the same era because their expectations and um, belief systems might be quite different. So that's where uh, working together with those expectations and the other components of evidence which I previously mentioned are very important and respectful. And I think you can see how that ties then into yeah. the uh, the model of uh, a patient centered care. But to highlight, Ian, and it's this is something until this very moment I hadn't thought of actually. Most industry have professional development, sometimes legislation, right? Accounting, legal, mm. and I and I I think you and I spoke about this just before we got on air. There's so many rabbit holes we could go down around today's session, which we'll have to park for another mm. time. But I mean, even this one, you know, a person out there doesn't know how much professional, when I say professional development, I'm saying what you've just described says you're learning and growing all the time. You're changing your techniques to best practice mm. based on a whole lot of factors, the three you just mentioned. 
and mm. you're never standing still. And I just wonder, you know, the, uh, the, and again, maybe not to answer today, but the, there may or may not be industry governed bodies that suggest the physio has to adhere to certain annual testing and that kind of thing. But it does make me wonder about smaller practices or less um, scientific based practices that, that might be implementing old fashioned or similar methodologies just because they don't have the latest research in front of them and they're not active in, in pursuing that. Um, so, mm. so again, like we do have, <laughs> uh, we do have, uh, that, that, uh, stipulated upon us. So, yeah. uh, but it's self-regulated in, in a large degree. Yeah. Okay. So this so is something we can, education is, is imposed. Yeah. We, we can explore this one deeper another time, but so in, so sure. you create a safe and an effective and challenging solution for your patient's problem area. Um, you, you know, leading out of what you've just just to summarize what you've just said, um, because of all that research and your approach, but how can our listeners take away some tips? And this might be a difficult one to answer to ensure that their physios or exercise physicians are doing the same for them. Um, I guess it's, it folds it all in. Like, you know, if, if they're listening to this and they're feeling like, oh, wow, because these are the kind of things you and I have spoken about, quite frankly, which is why, you know, I wanted you on air because there's a whole lot more that comes behind it than just, you know, jumping up on a table and, and rubbing someone's shoulder, for example. So that, that safe, mm. effective uh, outcome, um, you know, the things people should be thinking about that they can almost just stress test in their own minds that they're in the best care. Look, I think um, it's sort of an echoing point that we've been talking about uh, subtly through this whole discussion is that the passive nature of treatments is usually there just to facilitate a confidence and a capacity to be able to undertake active interventions, okay? So I could give you an example of a passive intervention might be a torn calf muscle that you would loosen up, okay? And you can speak uh, at first experience of that. Um, so we might mm -hmm. loosen up these calf tissues uh, but what we really want to do, and the science would tell us, is that we need to progressively load that calf tissue to increase its resilience and tolerance of load in future and hopefully get it to adopt all of the requirements and cap uh, capabilities that allows it to achieve, again, your desired outcome, okay? Whether it be play with grandchildren on the floor or be able to run a PB in uh, an Olympic marathon, okay? So this ability to um, dis to use passive treatments, number one, to facilitate the ability to do active treatments is what the passive work is really about. Yeah. And then to execute, understand that doing active stuff is the way that our tissues adapt. Okay, so our tissues are uh, evolved over tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years, in fact, to adapt particularly to forces and angles and loads. Okay, and so we want to try to find a way to safely execute a loading process which will stimulate the change that we're looking for. So that means it has to have a dosage that's appropriately high to stimulate and a safety that the tissue won't regress as you apply this load. Does that answer your question, Glenn? Yeah, it does. And I think, you know, as we move through the rest of this podcast, we'll, we're going to jump into some of those topics. Um, and so it, it most definitely does. Um, and I think maybe before we kind of jump into some of the questions I have about, about what you've just explained, um, maybe I'll just give a, a bit of um, background quickly, kind of to, to unpack that a little, um, how our journey kind of started. Because I think I'd seen you earlier on, but, you know, kind of eight to nine years ago now with my shoulder dislocations um, on each shoulder, it kind of taking a step back, everyone has their guru, you know, but in this case, um, I didn't. Also, you can hear by the accent, I'm an immigrant to Australia. So if, if I kind of think about real major issues on the body, I didn't kind of have the go-to and all I had was my GP's referral to a surgeon um, or two, which as you do, and then they, you kind of move through the process. So for me, um, the doctor at the time, 
um, who's now retired since retired, but even his understudy, um, you know, Dr. David Sonnerben did my first shoulder up and then his same practice referred me to you. Um, so we, you know, just before we explain that story. So in referring to me, uh, referring me to you, you know, saying, if you can fix me, I won't need to go into surgery. And literally that's what's happened to date. I, I haven't had to do that. Um, and, and I've explained the story about the pads and how you fix that. And the reason I'm saying everyone has their guru is because I've referred people to you after they saw two or three or four surgeons. So, so what I'm saying is in the time I've known you, I've kind of taken the model you've applied and it's, it's fixed me, to be honest. And maybe it's because our mindsets aligned, but they, they kind of swore that they were not fixable. You know, they've seen one, they've seen two, they've seen three different practitioners, um, and then I'm speaking to them and I've just said, look, I think those kind of three points you mentioned earlier before you, you have to actually understand what's going on. You, ha you have to understand the condition that's coming in. And then in terms of the maintenance plan, you have to be willing to be an active patient. So, so talking about the cough strain and, and what you just said, do you, do you think you can ex either, you know, explain a little bit around around maybe if people are in that boat where they're feeling like, you know, physio is not the answer because it didn't work for me. And, and kind of that background story to why was my case different? And, you know, without having to mention them, the few patients that, that I think we both know I've mentioned should call you. And I've given them the backdrop, like don't call Ian if you're not prepared to work. And, and it just dovetails on your previous question about safety and even that cough strain. And I think it's the program is where I'm heading, you know, that led to the recovery. So, so, Glenn, what I'd uh, just we think about here is that no, I, I had this discussion with actually a patient yesterday where she came after having um, three different practitioners look at her um, and I said to her, she, she said um, she was recommended by a GP to say, okay, well, okay, you've tried that, now let's try this approach, okay? And she was sort of coming thinking, oh, there's something special about Ian or something special about active care or something like that. And I would start by saying she's probably had really good practitioners look at her and I feel privileged that I'm at the end of it because then a lot of the work is already done. So what I looked for is more to say that she probably had very competent people look at her problem, but the things that they had applied thus far didn't resolve the problem. Now, what I there look for is where are the deficits? Where are the holes in this process where whether it be capacity or um, strength, for example, or something like that? Um, where are the holes that we could improve on? Okay. And so the process goes like this. We listen. We talk to the patient and listen carefully about what the, how they arrived at, at the junction that they're at now and also listen to what they want to be able to get to. Secondly, we take that information and then examine and we examine uh, with a few tests based upon experience and knowledge uh, from their story that helps us to target certain structures, okay? And then finally, what we will do is say, okay, well, you've been to three different people and they've tried A, B, and C, and they've worked, let's say, 60%, but haven't filled the rest of the gap. So you've still got a 40% problem. What are the components that have not been achieved here? And oftentimes it's something to do with the brain uh, not um, adapting to the, the new demands that you want to be able to achieve um, or the local tissues that were involved not adapting. So let's say you had a knee injury and you're now fearful of using your knee, uh, you're scared of having um, it injure again, your brain uh, responds with greater pain than it actually needs to uh, and the muscles around the knee have become weak. So our problem starts to become really clear then. Even though the knee is halfway better and most of the healing has actually happened, the brain needs to be calibrated to a level, or what I often use the term desensitized, to a level that it can 
uh, respond with pain and with apprehension or fear at the appropriate level mm. by exposure to activities. So, for example, if I'm scared to hop over a line, then I can slowly expose myself to um, smaller versions of that activity until I gain confidence again with it. At the same time, maybe the muscles around the knee are not strong enough locally to do that job, and then I need to do an exercise or some sort of intervention that builds the knee's capacity to do that. And so those two things, the brain and the local tissue, need to be um, encouraged to, to move up to, towards the, the goal that we've got. Okay, And that will also open up the can of worms that, okay, the longer I've had this, the more the area above and below that injury site mm-hmm. will also be deficient. Yeah. Got it. Awesome. Because I, like up until now, I just wanted, you know, again, I, I want the listeners to be able to resonate with what we're saying so far as what might be challenges. So the one I wanted to explore was, you know, different types of physios and the approach. And again, to reinforce this isn't a physio bas- bashing session per se. And I'm using that term broadly physio. I know that that's not only what you do and what others out there might, might do. But then I think I might want to turn the conversation a little bit towards actual methods um, that I think people don't realize, but they're in front of them as tools. And the first one being preventative maintenance, right, as, as, as the hot topic, the kind of that word. Mm. So to give an example that we can all relate to, when I had that ACL up and, you know, that was probably five years after I initially saw you and in 2017, to be clear, around about there, where, you know, I, I'd done the ACL, um, the cruciate ligaments in the knee for people listening, it's, it's something if you sprinted forward, stopped abruptly and turned right, heard a cracking sound inside your knee, you'd stand up and walk, but if you did it again, you know, sprinted forward, turned, you'd probably fall over because you've just snapped the ligament that holds those together. Um, ho- hopefully that's a simple name and explanation, uh, Ian. But in, in any event, um, when I think about the fact that I was told, and, and this is specifically where I'm heading to, is if people are told in advance, you're going into surgery, which I think happens quite commonly, you know, whether it's a hernia or whether it's a, it's a future date, um, I came to you to ask for a preventative, because my logic was, if I'm healthier, if I'm stronger going into this op, you know, the, the, and to be clear, the injury I had, the rest of my body was fine. But we know that in recovery, if you've got healthy immune system, et cetera, you, you'll recover quicker when you come out of a surgery. So I just thought I'd, I'd kind of um, introduce this concept of risk management in the form of exercise maintenance and kind of the concept of a preventative maintenance plan. And if maybe you could just you know, talk about that a little from your side, you know, on the back of the story. Okay. So there's two main arms to this that I would suggest that we mention. And, and this is a, like a whole <laughs> another lecture, so we can we can go really deeply into this. But I think we should um, let your listeners in t- to enjoy the understanding of how it can help them. And the, the first thing is that um, some beautiful research has has been undertaken in the last, particularly in the last 10 years, um, and mostly in the last five or six years. Um, If we look at something as simple as osteoarthritis management, and we understand now that there's a a big focus on trying to get people to be far more active with their osteoarthritis, say for example, in their knee, um, as opposed to having surgery. So the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners have a guideline that says that the first line of treatment for osteoarthritis should be education, or as I call it, understanding, um, weight management, and exercise. That's the first man, the first step that you should take if you've got problems with the knee arthritis. Second level would be um, more passive type treatments. There could be injections, um, manual therapies, uh, acupuncture, um, drugs, braces, this sort of stuff, Th- stuff that people do to you. And then the third thing is then if all of those things fail, then a surgical intervention. Because the problem is at the moment that three times as many people at the moment will end up going to surgery than actually try step one. Mm. Three times as many. Um, And so the likelihood that they'll end up having surgery is very high. Yeah. So 
This is based upon some wonderful um, research that's been done by colleagues of ours um, in Australia and overseas. And one simple program, beautiful program conducted in North Shore uh, at the hospital there, where they look at conducting exactly this process. They take all of the public list of patients who are referred for a hip or knee surgery to go through step one and two first. You can't have the surgery on the public list until you go through step one and two. And just by doing this active-based approach, 20% of the people drop off the list for surgery. Don't need surgery. They were all lined up for having surgery. And yeah. Imagine if every fifth person you said, you don't need surgery, you don't need surgery, you don't need surgery. Or in fact, what's happening is they're saying, I don't need surgery. Okay. Mm. Then the other side is what you mentioned earlier, is that there's this preventative um, and ma- maintaining process. So the outcomes of the people who end up having surgery are far better if they've conducted as a prehabilitation or preparatory process, mm. exercise and strength training prior to going into surgery. So that is if you do exercise and strength training prior to going into surgery under supervision, um, in this case in a physiotherapy environment, you have a far better chance of avoiding um, some of the complications of uh, the knee replacement as compared to those who go in unprepared. Okay, so that's one facet that it's actually available to the average person that you could see. It could be a relative, it could be um, someone, the average uh, 60-year-old person who is not thinking exercise, they're thinking, I've got to get my knee moving again and surgery is the go for me, that this preventative approach um, is at least preparatory for a good outcome if you do have surgery, but at best maybe even helps you to avoid surgery. The second side to this comes in um, some beautiful research by Australian researchers that has actually disseminated worldwide now at the highest levels of sporting endeavour. And uh, the research basically discovered that as much as we have tried to use biomechanics over the last few decades, in the time that I've been practising at least, um, using biomechanics to predict injury. So, for example, I've got a tight um, quadriceps muscle and that predis- I, I might guess that that predisposes me, might predict that I will have a greater likelihood of having a hip or knee or thigh injury. And we tried for several decades to ana- analyse people's capacity, their, their function, their flexibility and so on by doing what we call screenings um, on athletes, for example. And after all of this, we find that there's very little sound confidence in being able to predict injury. Yet this Australian research has gradually and very clearly shown that if we look at how much a person is exercising, that volume of exercise based upon frequency, duration, and intensity, we can gain great understanding as to their capacity for future exercise. And to such an extent that we can be very clear about the risks involved with undertaking exercise at different volumes in future. So this could mean, for example, that if I've been used to running three kilometres two times a week, I could predict my risk of injury for soft tissues uh, if I were to choose a 50% increase or a 100% increase in that activity, let's say I chose to do six kilometres um, twice a week, uh, I could actually see there's a commensurate increase in my risk of injury as a result of that. Okay. And so that's a brief explanation of it. <laughs> but um, we're collecting this data all the time. We're collecting it on our phones, on our, on our wearables. Um, we're collecting this data all the time. And if we 
don't get bogged down so much in the data and more become interested in how to interpret it and make it relevant to, if we wind back to patient-centered care, our goal, then we can actually use measurement of activity to help to predict what the future holds for us and what we could then choose to do to help to prevent injury. Got it. I hope that doesn't sound too yeah. complex, Glenn. You know, I don't think, look, it's not a simple thing, but I, what I love is that you, you're just using the examples of, and, and just to kind of help for anyone that might have felt lost about that, because you and I have done these, you know, sessions talking about these things is, is you've <clears throat> put simple examples and terms behind it. So, so one, people out there, you know, firstly, if you get a diagnosis, you need surgery. What I'm hearing you say is there's a one in five chance that it could be preventable. I'm not saying it is. I'm saying there's a thought process there to, to just ask that question, right? And and two, that's if- That's just with, that's sorry, going on to Jeff there. That's just looking at that public uh, list yeah. of hip and knee arthritis right. patients, okay? For other conditions, it's higher or lower according to what the So to stress is, you, okay? case by but case- what I'm saying is- <laughs> Yes. This is not a diagnosis we're making here. It's just a, kind of an observation and, and more of a thought process than anything. Um, that mm, case by case, mm. people should just have that in their minds. That is, is it worth asking that question? You know, and it may, maybe for what it's mm. worth, we leave mm. that, that topic there. But um, the more importantly is just for lifestyle, if nothing else, don't wait around for an incident to cause you to get active or build a plan or – so in the case of a surgery, which is drastic, which is what we're talking about, um, you know, don't wait till after. And I think I'm also hearing maybe my mindset is a bit old fashioned in that it's, it sounds like the public sector is suggesting you can get fit before an operation in certain circumstances. If, uh, you know, if someone was slightly higher than the weight that they should be for their relative persona, um, that, that it's just good to be healthy in general, but going into a surgery even more so, so that when you come out, there, there's likely going to be a program right, to get the limbs the around that issue active again. And and one can go in with a plan is what I'm saying to prehab. That's That, that I think is the buzzword here, like prehab, pre, um, mm -hmm. prehabilitation. Mm -hmm. And then there'll be post-op rehabilitation, uh, which is obviously a mm -hmm. different thing, but they can be connected. And I, I, I just, the people I speak to on a daily basis, when you say that, it sounds so simple. And and that's what I'm trying to bring out of, of the science you just gave us is it is that simple. Just open a conversation now that you're thinking about it, because a lot of people just wouldn't think about that. They'd kind of get the diagnosis, go have the surgery. Hopefully there is someone good in there like yourself or the surgeon who's saying, consider a, a prehab program. But I guess my, my, big, my big takeaway for the listeners is consider a prehab program if you didn't know about it before this podcast. Um, and then, mm, yeah. you know, I think again, just, just shifting topics slightly, but keeping on, on track, um, you know, I saw you back in 2020 and in May and I jumped off a ledge um, a meter high, literally heard and felt the snap and the sharp pain, like a bee sting in the side of my leg. Um, it was three months before my big four by four by 48 challenge last year. Um, in 2020 in November. And and uh, for those that need a reference, it will put in the show notes and you can look at the website and just see what that was. It was quite, quite awesome and exciting. But we went on a program, we resolved that and I managed to fix the challenge. So coming back into the example you just used before where it's like you can either run, you know, six kilometers three times a week um, or twice a week with a, with a big run at the end of a week or invert that where it's, you know, it's three kilometers twice a week and then a big run at the end of the week. Um, and just to correct that, you know, longer runs midweek, shorter run at the end of the week, or invert that, um, shorter runs midweek, longer run at the end of the week. Where I'm heading with it is after I strained my calf muscle, um, and, and this is just uh, January, February this year, knowing I was going into a 45 kilometer race, which I just completed this week, injury free mile, I add, I came to see you eight weeks ago to say, you know, I'm in serious trouble here because I strained my calf in February and I knew I couldn't run on it. I had to kind of, um, get onto a, a program to correct the calf strain. But then I had this goal of 45 kilometers um, in, in front of me. So it seems every time I try, you know, the reason I strain my calf is I cut the corner in trying to bulk up and load too soon. So coming back to that example, you know, maybe I was running 10 kilometers a Tuesday, 10 kilometers a Thursday, and then trying to smash a 20 kilometer run on a Sunday. I did that for four weeks, growing my Sunday run by like 10% each week. And then week number five, the calf blew out. 
And then I had to go back to square yeah. one where we're introducing smaller distances, more measured. And that's on the back of coming to see you and you giving me that advice. So I think coming to this simple example of distance and time and days, can you explain why, why that kind of calf strain happened in that example of growing my long run 10%? So assuming there's a consistent midweek run, but then on the end of the week, jumping on 10%, um, you're kind of like, why does that kind of um, stress happen on the body where you actually strain a muscle? Mm. Okay. So, Glenn, the first thing is to remember that even uh, – and this same research that we're talking about, about how much work you've done or how much workload you've done in um, previous times, in recent time, can help you to understand what you're safe to do now or it's in the near future. The Even this research shows that – you can do everything correctly and have about a three to five percent chance of getting injured anyway. Soft tissue injuries you're talking about here, but it possibly also pertains to um, stress fractures as well. Um, so soft tissue injury is probably going to be out there at around about a three to five percent prevalence anyway. Okay, so we've got a high risk uh, when we're going into higher workloads compared to what we've been used to. So if over the past month I've been used to, let's say, doing 10K runs and I double my my load to this week to 20K runs, then all of a sudden I've got a, a 100% increase in workload and I may well have um, uh, increased my risk from 3 to 5% right up to like 15%. So that doesn't seem like much of a jump, but if you look at it in multiples, it's like three to five times the injury rate, um, injury risk that I had uh, when I was doing the same thing uh, over and over again. So what that says is that, number one, we've got a little bit of risk all the time, and that's part of pushing tissues. But number two, that we can have an escalation of of workload that moves outside of the uh, safe zone of um, training and that increases your risk of injury. And this uh, concept is called the acute chronic workload ratio. And so acute meaning what I'm doing now and today or this week, compared to the chronic, which is what I've done, let's say, in a period of time prior to today, uh, it, and different um, scientists use different methods. So they might say three weeks or four weeks or a month or whatever, okay? And they look at the average of that activity over that period of time and compare it to what I'm doing this week. And if that ratio starts to stray too far away from being a ratio of one to one, then the injury risk could start to increase. The interesting thing about this is that also if the ratio starts to diminish, so let's say you're doing only 50% of what you used to do, then your injury risk also increases. <laughs> so your injury risk increases if you do way too much and your injury risk increases if you do way too little. And you can guess why the way too little, if you just care to explore, is that you start to become uh, deconditioned and uh, sensitive to activities when you avoid them. Okay. Amazing. So our injury risk is related to how much we've been doing in recent times. Okay. So you can't just say, okay, I'm just going to bump it up by 10% every time and that should be fine. Okay. We've got to look at the volume of activity. 10% of what? Of duration. But what about frequency? What about intensity? Did you run harder over that extra 10%? Did you run lighter? You know, and so on and so forth. And it's such an interesting topic, Ian, and it, it's something you and I have worked on for a while, uh, where I can safely say that the injuries that I've had are on my own, <laughs> my own silliness. 
I think it's a topic I'd love to return to about actually how we could probably dedicate a whole episode to that. Uh, actually, people listen where we mm. can actually unpack it. You know, it's a whole lot of value. So I think I'd like mm. to invite you back to do that in, in a couple of weeks' time, if you don't mind. Um, but but kind yeah. of, um, you, you know, just maybe I might summarize and, and kind of bring things towards a close, uh, if that's okay. That kind of wraps it all up and brings it together, which which I just drew. It's interesting, but just drawing it off your website actually, and it's what I, I love about your approach. And, and literally reading this from your website, it, you know, it says with a focus on using activity and strength training to restore function. Ian combines his exercise and activity programs with his extensive hands-on skills in sports physiotherapy. He carefully creates treatments which help you recover from your injury or condition and to enhance your performance in your chosen activity, whether it's simple everyday activity or elite function, you understand that you are at your very best as a person when you are functioning well. Um, so Ian, I can honestly say that you live up to this mantra. Uh, I think any listener, having heard you just unpack that now, um, I think I, you know I'm a living, breathing um, a fit, and I'm fitter because of it. Um, good, you know, good healthy case study uh, for all the techniques and the deep dive that you've done in what you've just explained today. Some say my mind is not a hundred percent in terms of um, the things that I do and 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 how that's adjusted over time. And I've also jumped out of an airplane before, you know, skydiving and things like that. So maybe I'm not a good barometer, but you certainly are. Um, I should explain, you know, that certain words on that website are bolded, you know, around optimal function and some of the the topics that we've highlighted today. I'd be honoured if you, if you could use these. Um, you know, just handing it back to you, just to summarize, maybe one one takeaway or advice out of the breadth of beautiful topics you've shared today that you'd like for our listeners to take away with them. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's, um, Put you on the spot. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a bit of a, yeah, it has. I think it comes back to what we talked about right at the beginning, Glenn, and that is that everybody's in a different lane and they're all going to the place that they want to go. And so... We've got to stay focused on what we want, um, the, the lifestyle that we want to have, the quality of life that we want to have, and what presses our buttons, what gives us, what excites us and what um, makes us happy, okay? And then set up a pathway to how to get there. And if that means that uh, uh, an injury is in the way of, of that and uh, you need a, some physical help, then you go to a physical therapist to, to help you with that. If it be a psychological condition um, also or or on its own, then uh, you go to someone who has expertise in psychology to help you with that. But we're living in a wonderful era where we've got good understanding of lots of um, conditions, but we've got to match up the right um people with the right uh, condition and respect the person so that they are at the centre of their care. And then go to your goal. Go down your path. And your path, you might think you're swimming in a lane very slowly and the guy next to you is swimming really fast, but he's in a different lane. He's going somewhere else. Mm. You're going down your path. And the path, if you choose honestly to set your goal the way you'd like your lifestyle to be and to get create quality of life for you that's meaningful and then create your um, pathway to get there with experts around you, then you're likely to achieve your goal and have a better quality of life. Amazing, Ian. Thank you. Uh, and I think, yeah, in closing, um, and also just to lift out of that, um, you've covered so much today <laughs> for us. I think in simple terms, what we're trying to focus on is exercise activity in general, no matter the person or what it is. And so whilst, uh, mm. you know, my, my, it's not my favorite, but probably the one I have the most knowledge in is running. People think I'll just put my shoes mm. on, I'll go out there and I'll run. So on the one hand, there's the actual activity itself. Um, behind the scenes, you've given me a strength training program. So whilst I am running three times a week, I'm spending two weeks in a gym, strengthening up all my stabilizing muscles, ligaments, et cetera, right? And you've crafted that plan for me and I go and I implement it. And when I do, earlier I alluded to it, I don't get injured. When I stop the strength, strength and I just keep running, generally it leads to injury for one reason or another. So 
Mm. For the list now, I'm, I, I'd suggest, you know, don't do one without the other. I say this from experience and, and it kind of as an expert in the trail running and the soft sand running field, make sure that you have a routine exercise and activity program, not a kind of one-off that expires or it's an eight-week challenge. You know, seek advice from professionals if you can't go it alone. Uh, I can refer mine, obviously. <laughs> He's on the call, Ian. Or ask, you know, your community, your friends surrounding you, Take the time to learn about your injuries and how to recover properly and then seeking to enhance and you know your performance and whether that's getting you know off the couch and just doing five kilometers that's enhancing your performance or heading to a much bigger goal or more of a professional goal. Kind of understand what activities and performance make you function and function well. And then finally, in the words of my truly great training partner, Guy Miller, uh, and bringing really together the core of what Ian's taken us through today is to finish stronger than you started. So until the next episode, Ian, thank you so much kindly for being on the show today. Um, train harder to everyone out there. And um, yeah, many thanks, Ian. Thank you for having me, Glenn. It's been a pleasure. We will return, hopefully. Thanks for listening to Outside Your Comfort Zone with Glenn Miller, your comfort zone coach. If you like what you hear, help spread the word. Subscribe to the podcast and invite a friend. For show notes, links, and extra goodies, visit comfortzonecoach.com.au.